In Buddhist monasteries such as this one, morning prayer is a daily ritual. What differentiates this temple from all other temples in the world are the house pets of these revered monks. The temple was constructed as a forest monastery. Today, there are more tigers than monks living here. This is the legendary tiger temple in Thailand, where monks and tigers live together in harmony. And this is monk Pra Acham. Pra Achan is the abbot of the monastery and the hero of this story about the tiger and the monk. The tiger next to me is called Paiyu. When he first came here, he was two months old. Today he weighs over 200 kilograms and is now the biggest. This magical world is situated in the province of Kanchanamburi in the west of Thailand and only two hours drive from the noisy city of Bangkok. In 1976, my doctor said to me that I had leukemia. At that time, I had decided to become a monk. For many years, I went meditating through the wilderness from one monastery to another. At that time, I often met many wild animals. That's why I'm so at ease with them. The Tiger Temple is not a splendorous facility, but a place of calm. The small houses that the monks live in lie scattered about the forest. There is only one large building, the Prayer Temple, which is at the center of the facility. Wat Pa Luang Tabua Yana Sampano is the official name of the monastery. In Thailand, it is known as the Tiger Temple. There are approximately a dozen monks that live here together with the 16 tigers. The tigers are kept in cages, but the abbot makes sure that they get plenty of exercise. Within the area of the temple, there lies a small gulch called the Valley of the Tigers. Buddhists firmly believe in reincarnation, in rebirth. The tigers are so close to me that they could be my children or grandchildren. Maybe in my past life, they were part of my family. I am often asked if I am afraid of the tigers. No, I'm not afraid. Perhaps it is because I was born in the year of the tiger. When I found out I had leukemia, the doctor told me that I would soon die. That was 30 years ago and I am still alive. I'm not afraid of death. Pra Achan is not an animal trainer. He has no relevant education. But nevertheless, he bridles adult tigers and directs them, without chains and cages, without any power. It is even more astonishing that he brought about this trick in such a short amount of time. Oh, 
สือตัวแรกเข้ามาเมื่อปีหนึ่งเก้าเก้าเก้าเข้ามาโดยการญาติโยมเขาถวาย The first tiger came to us in 1999. A female tiger had attacked a farmer's cow. The farmer killed the tiger and took its cub. Then one of the landowners brought the cub here. The little tiger ended up in the hands of a taxidermist. Its new owner wanted it stuffed. This presumably happened in December 1998. The taxidermist had already cut open the skin on his back. We could see the scar later. The animal was already weak. It's a wonder that the little tiger survived this torture. The man tried to kill the cub. He also injected it with something, but astonishingly, the tiger survived. If someone tries to kill an animal and it survives, it must be brought to a temple. This is demanded by tradition. Some kind-hearted people bought the animal from the taxidermist for 5,000 baht, about $120. The farmers simply took the tiger and in February 1999 brought him to our temple. We took care of the tiger, and despite his terrible experiences, he was a very trusting animal. But nevertheless, in the end, he died. He was simply too weak. Shortly thereafter, two men from the Karen people came to us. They live in the mountainous region between Thailand and Burma. And they brought two tiger cubs over the border to us. It had apparently been said of us that we take in orphan tigers. In the end, it was always the same story. Somebody had killed the mother, and then her offspring were found in the forest. Soon we had three tigers. Then it was four, five, and then six. Some were brought to us from the Karen, other tigers from the border police. Another time, some farmers came, they were Muslim, with a tiger cub. In the year 2000, we had eight tigers. One of these eight was Paiyu. Where do they all come from? Who killed Paiyu's mother? Who killed the other female tigers? And why do new ones come month after month? If you follow the tracks back to the Tiger Temple, you would come directly to the mountainous forests in the west. Not far from the temple lies the last big nature reserve in Thailand. Protected regions like the Kane Kashan National Park directly border the far-reaching original rainforests in Myanmar. According to the latest estimates, about another 40 tigers live in the park in an area of about 3,000 square kilometers. In the whole of Thailand, there are at the very most 200 remaining. The problems are the same everywhere. There are not enough forests that have plentiful habitat and prey for the big predators. And despite strict laws and bans, the tigers continue to be hunted. The forest is dense and mountainous, but there are hunters who can find their way quite effortlessly, using rifles, poison and dynamite in order to capture a tiger. This land is the last place of sanctuary for Thailand's endangered species. 
The Cain Kashan forms the so-called Western Forest Complex, together with eight other national parks. It comprises of nearly 20,000 square kilometers of wilderness, which on paper at least is protected. Highly specialized species like hornbills depend on such protective areas. They can only survive if they have the correct climate, trees, shrubs and food supply. It is the same problem for the gibbons, who live in high trees and eat only certain fruit. Unfortunately, the wilderness not only offers protection to rare kinds of species, but also to the poachers, who come here to hunt tigers. In the park there are regular patrols, but in this labyrinth it seems the search for poachers is hopeless. The supervisors of the park try to prevent the worst. They go outside the tiger's territory, look for tracks, keep records, and supervise the park as well as they can. Even rangers like Sutat, who has spent his whole life in the primeval forest, has never come face to face with a live tiger. The fresh tracks are at least proof that tigers live in Kane Kashan Park. But in Thailand, there is a man who can make them visible. Bruce Kakuli is an animal photographer and conservation author who has worked in the primeval forests of Thailand for over 20 years. The qualified technician follows the tigers with his own hand-built photo traps. Within the case, there is a camera. If an animal runs past, the infrared sensor captures the image. His cameras can catch what no human eye can see in the heart of darkness. Enchanting portraits of some of the last wild tigers living in Thailand. Why is it that these last remaining tigers are still mercilessly hunted? Thai scientist and conservationist Dr. Chisanu gives an intriguing answer. The habitat loss, that is not the problem. But the problem is uh, traditional Chinese medicine. Uh, in Thailand now, they can breed more tiger and some they do illegal, make the traditional Chinese medicine, they still do it. But uh, it's illegal, nobody know. But uh, for the tiger in the wild, that is a very special. They want, uh, the, we talk about the special order because of, uh, they not want the farm tiger. They want tiger in the wild. They want the, the wild, the real wild one. Then uh, that is a special order to, to hunting the tiger in the wild. Of what use are the national parks if the last tigers are taken from their forests by assassins? Just as in the business of illegal drugs, the rich handle the requests and the poor deliver the product. A hunter can get between $6,000 and $7,000 for a wild tiger, more than many of the men will make in their entire lifetime. Images of what the craft looks like in practice can be seen over and over again in Thai newspapers. Whenever the police catch illegal traders, the tigers make headlines. Unfortunately, from the prey which is channeled abroad year after year, 
only a fraction are caught in the net by the investigators. Illegal trade blossoms and continues to prosper. Every single tiger is special. Each one has feelings, thoughts and dreams. These tigers are not here by chance. They came to me looking for protection. Now I am responsible for them. In the Buddhist doctrine, every single tiger is important. They stand practically on the same level as humans. International organizations like WWF also want to keep Thailand's tigers from becoming extinct. For them, only the protection of the entire species and its natural habitat counts. Western experts tend to perceive this little Shangri-La as an amusing zoo. But the tigers at the temple are well cared for with the Buddhist way of life. Many walks end without fail at the pond in the tiger's gulch. Water has a magical appeal for tigers. <laughs> Song Tai, the little monk, is an orphan. He was found one day just standing in front of the gates of the monastery. The little tigers and Song Tai share the same fate and together they enjoy their childhood to the fullest. The monks give the boy and the tigers absolute freedom. Modern animal husbandry might look different, but few zoos in the world could offer their tigers so much variety and exercise. The peaceful picture can be deceptive. Tigers are not family animals, and for excursions, the highest precautions are demanded. Young, cheeky tigers are often injured or even killed by the adults. Pet or hunter, kitten or killer. Those who have no access to Buddhism must stay alert in the presence of tigers. Should the adult male tiger run riot, Krubasam and Songtai would have no chance. But in all these years, nobody has been hurt. In spite of the exotic cohabitants, Wat Luang Tabua is above all a Buddhist temple. Every morning at seven o'clock, the monks collect rice, bits of food and sweets from the surrounding area of the temple. In Buddhism, the act of giving is seen in this way. It is not the monks who profit from alms, but those with whom they share. Because with every action, one influences the future, and those who do good deeds collect, so to speak, plus points for their future life, thus for themselves. During the fasting time, between July and November, many monks come to me in the temple to meditate.
but often only two or three monks live here with me. Therefore, I alone am responsible for the tigers. I would like some monks to stay longer and help me out. One day, I will need a successor. The gate to the empire of the big cats, the innermost district of the monastery. For safety reasons, a second wall now surrounds the area where the tigers live. After the morning prayer comes the high point in the daily lives of the monks, eating breakfast together in the temple. The morning meal is important because the monks have a ravenous appetite. They are not allowed to eat anything after midday, and therefore breakfast is the only meal. The young tigers always attend breakfast. The four siblings are about six months old and unable to stand still for even a second. Don't try this at home. Only with Buddhist calmness is breakfast with small tigers possible. In the first year, I had no cages for the tigers. They ran around free the whole day. I didn't know how to deal with them, and so we fed them what we ate. They ate rice or chicken soup with lemon juice. From the beginning, many Thai people said that it was not the duty of monks to care for tigers. There are problems with the public authorities and the police. It was only when we became known throughout the whole country that it got a little easier. Song Tai does not have to fast for the rest of the day, nor does he have to meditate as the others do or read Buddhist scripture. After breakfast, he does what every child his age does. He goes to school. The temple pets help to dispose of the leftovers from breakfast. The monks now have no other duty but to busy themselves with Buddha's teachings and to practice self-knowledge. It is forbidden for Buddhist monks to work for money. The abbot organizes a whole staff of carers that are responsible for the hard work. About 80 kilos of deep frozen chickens are cooked daily for the tigers. A wise decision because in Thailand, dozens of zoo tigers have already died from bird flu, transferred by raw chicken meat. A few of the carers have developed into real tiger experts. They don't look particularly concerned and they know exactly what they're doing and understand the tiger's slightest movement or sound. Apart from the abbot, virtually nobody knows and understands the tigers as well as they do. The wet cats are no orphans from the primeval forest. They are, so to speak, the second generation and were born here in the temple. Clearly, the abbot is not a zoo manager, but 
a Buddhist. The tigers have the same needs as people. Whenever I hear a female calling, I open the cage door so that the males can visit them. The first generation came three years after the arrival of the first tigers. How many cubs there have been, I do not know exactly. Some died soon after birth. They were too weak or the mother killed them. This also happens in nature over and over again. Every tiger in the monastery has a heavenly name. The two small ones are called Great Heavens and Glittering Star. Others are called Cloud, Sunshine, Lightning or Rainbow. The team with the blue t-shirts must not only clean the tigers, but also the cages, make and prepare the food and generally do everything by hand. For us, the tiger is something special. It counts as one of the five most important animals in Buddhism, next to the elephant, the horse, the cow, and the buffalo. They stand above all other animals and can also reach the steps to enlightenment. No question, the tigers are the stars but by no means are they the only animals that live here. Those who visit the temple late in the afternoon will not cease to be amazed. At exactly five o'clock, from nothing, hundreds of animals appear. They come from every corner and niche of the extensive property to eat their supper. Apparently, there are a few thousand animals on the grounds of the monastery, although no one has actually counted them. Cattle, buffalo, wild boars, horses, deer, and a dozen peacocks wander around uninhibited, mate and reproduce as they so choose, and are fed as well as possible. They are all protégés of pra Achan, this crazy zoo formed all by itself. The first horse, for example, was an old nag retired from the army that someone brought here. It was a mare, and then one day a stallion walked in from outside and they mated. It was his instinct. He smelled the mare and they produced many offspring. We now have approximately 20 horses. Dr. Somchai is a veterinarian, a counsellor, and a kind of secular manager of the tiger temple. Somchai was there when the first tiger cub came, and to this day he provides medical care for the tigers, gives them their necessary injections, and helps the abbot in his fight against bureaucracy. Somchai regards the chaotic zoo with mixed feelings. Proper veterinary medical care is not possible here. This young boar recently killed the old leader in a fight. Now he is the boss. The wild boars dominate all the others here. Even the tigers are afraid of them. These were also the first animals that came to the temple. <laughs> The first pig that arrived here was beaten up and had a broken back and came crawling in with two legs, so we nursed it and gave it rice for my breakfast. It stayed with us for three or four weeks until it recovered. Later, there was a forest fire nearby, so the boar took his family and came with all the herd to stay at the temple. When I saw him, I was delighted to see that he was still alive and had not been shot. The pig had totally recovered, and he had brought his friends. I did not know what to do with all of them, 
but they were behaving well and made no trouble. So they were here to stay and never left again. Where thousands of wild boars and 16 tigers live, there is no time for even the most peaceful monk to meditate because there is always a problem. One of the young tigers, Glittering Star, got too near an angry large male. He was slung high in the air. Since then, he has been limping and crying. His right hind leg is injured. At this age, infection is particularly dangerous. Monk Krubasam and the carers decide to go to a nearby animal hospital. Just like children, young tigers hate hospital visits. The lady on the reception desk is irritated. Even in Thailand, it is not every day that a tiger comes in to be admitted. This is not a kitten coming in to be examined, but a tiger, and the difference will soon be noticed. The staff shows suitable respect. If this patient bites, he will leave a very large bite mark. A sedative in reserve, a muzzle, three keepers and a monk are more or less enough to protect the medical staff. After a lot of resistance, a diagnosis is made. The joint is injured and Glittering Star must be isolated immediately and treated with medication. Around the monastery, a strange community has formed. An animal family that in the wild would be inconceivable. Here, one can observe animal stories that are nearly as unusual as the tiger and the monk. Peacock courts and runs after a female, while right next to them, two deer are involved in a violent duel. Two samba deer seem to be fighting over rank, just two meters away from the access road to the temple.
Samba deer are among the most important prey in Thailand's forests. If the tigers were to run free here, the deer would definitely have other worries. Animals, so it seems, are the abbot Pra Achan's karma. Not only the tigers, deer or wild boars have come to him. About a dozen water buffaloes also live here, an animal which is only rarely found in Buddhist monasteries. We never actually planned to have an animal sanctuary. I remember how the buffaloes arrived. The king celebrated the 56th anniversary of his coronation. Some farmers bought 56 buffaloes. They saved them from the slaughterhouse and brought them as a donation to the temple. I said, how should I feed the buffaloes? I can't take them. But they just let the animals loose and left without saying a word. Miraculously, the abbot directs the tiger around all the animals without major problems. Admittedly, Pra Achan does not know exactly where or how his outing with Paiyu will end. Before the abbot notices it, Paiyu has broken loose and swims in a pool which normally only the buffaloes come to. They may be accustomed to people, but they have not been tamed, nor are they performing tigers. Prachan becomes pensive. The sun begins to set. It would not be possible to leave Paiyu alone. It is not worth thinking about what would happen if Paiyu picked up the scent of a deer or a horse. The only trick remaining is chicken in a plastic bag. Paiyu knows the smell, cooked chicken meat. He eats at least five kilos of it daily. It almost looks as if Pra Achan must spend the night with a swimming tiger. But in the end, hunger wins him over. A magical hour. After sunset, the monks gather together to meditate in the temple.
the monastery was founded by one of the greatest Buddhist scholars in Thailand. And it was also named after him, Luang Tha Maha Bua. Luang Tha consciously allowed the cloister to be established in the forest because the wilderness is a special place for meditation. Buddha lived in the forest and was illuminated there, as did many of his pupils. The tigers make their big appearance once a day. Those that are more or less in a good mood are brought out of their cages by the monks and carers. The tigers are happy about this diversion. They know that visitors are waiting because for a few years now, tourists have been allowed in the temple. From midday, many visitors begin to gather, while in the background, the stars assemble. The entrance fees are sadly necessary because this menagerie, especially the tigers, costs a small fortune. The abbot has no financial means and donations alone are not enough to feed the hungry mouths. The meat alone for the tigers costs $12,000 per year. I have tried from the very beginning to make the temple known. We need support. So I have done everything I can to get into the newspapers. I have even ridden on a tiger for the photographers. In an upbeat manner, Pra Achan marches in the Valley of the Tigers with the group. The ease with which the abbot brings tourists and tigers together is extraordinary. Indeed, the photo tiger is selected carefully. In each case, only the most relaxed tiger may attend, and the others are taken back to the valley by the carers. Two years ago, tourists could still walk around the tigers without attendance. But today, in comparison, the Valley of the Tigers is a high-level security tract. Every Western zoo director would be blown away. Visitors in close contact with adult tigers and no guards or guns. How dangerous are the tigers really? Are the monks magicians or gamblers? There are at least some precautions. The tigers are chained Carers and volunteers organize the stream of visitors, take care of photographs, and carefully guide every single person by hand. Therefore, nobody comes up with any silly ideas. Thousands of tourists have experienced this risky adventure, and up to now, there hasn't been even the slightest mishap. An accident would be fatal. The monastery has no license for keeping tigers, and for many years the ministry has threatened to confiscate them. That's why no more orphan tigers are admitted. For the time being, there are no more of their own offspring. The second generation is sexually mature, but in order to handle the problem of inbreeding, other tigers would have to be brought into the temple. Without a license, this is not possible. Does this paradise have an expiration date? Not for Pra Acham. He has great plans and wants to use donations to realize a new project, a tiger island. Protected by a moat, the tourists would then be able to look into the forest, where the tigers move about freely.
the tigers would be able to hunt animals and produce offspring on the island as one survives in the wild. These tigers could once again be taken back into the primeval forest. That sounds like distant dreams of the future, but Pra Achan will not give up. I tell them that we have to make this temple well known, and I also tell them that I will return their children and grandchildren to the forest. I whisper in their ears in Thai about the way to get them back to the forest. We need a lot of money and we need lots of supporters. To get back to the forest, they have to work hard for themselves and the next generation. I whisper to them this message. At the moment, they don't understand much Thai. They prefer English. If you learn how to communicate from the heart, they will become very tame with you, and they will also listen to your commands. I tell them like this, work, 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 or else no money, no chicken. The relaxed, almost calm setting compared with earthly adversities is a sign of the Buddhist way of thinking and is also perhaps its special strength. This is the only reason why this almost unreal peace is produced between man and tiger. His dreams of the tiger's homecoming may be naive. Maybe neither the abbot nor anyone else can save the last tigers of Thailand. For 16 tigers, however, the temple is home, and the monk their only guarantee of survival. <laughs>